Aloha and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the third session of the Strengthening South Korea-United States Science and Tech Partnership on Critical Technologies Dialogue, U.S.-South Korea Cybersecurity Cooperation in the Era of 5G and 6G, held with support from the Consulate General of the Republic of Korea in Honolulu, and in partnership with George Mason Korea's Center for Security Policy Studies. My name is Crystal Pryor, and I'm Vice President and Director of Research at the Pacific Forum. Fifth generation mobile technology, or 5G, is expected to have a tremendous impact on the digital economy. It will allow improved data transmission speeds and capacities compared to previous standards of cellu cellular networks. <clears throat> but 5G's decentralized and distributed software-based digital routing affords hackers more access points that are difficult to monitor. This presents a challenge to traditional notions of cybersecurity as 5G props up an ecosystem of various devices and activities. Today's virtual discussion will examine the implications of 5G and its successor sixth generation wireless network technology from a cybersecurity perspective. Pacific Forum's new strengthening ROK US Science and Tech Partnership on Critical Technologies Dialogue is a three-part online series plus in-person workshop that examines the collaborative partnership between the United States and South Korea in AI and robotics semiconductors, and cybersecurity in 5G, 6G. You can learn more about this series at the link in the chat box now. This series aims to provide policy recommendations that can enhance the flow of investment, talent, and technology between the US and South Korea amid the fragmentation of regional <clears throat> supply chains, great power competition, and geoeconomic volatility. By the end of this project, we hope participants will have a better grasp on how the US and South Korea can achieve policy alignment and synergy to spur deeper research and development collaboration on AI and robotics, semiconductors, cybersecurity, 5G, <clears throat> 6G. I'll now hand the mic over to our Senior Research Fellow and Director of Cybersecurity and Critical Technologies, Mark Manantan, who has served as moderator for this series. Mark, if you would. Thank you very much, Crystal. In the first session of US and South Korea's prospects and challenges in AI and robotics, we convened three experts who offered insights into how the US and South Korea can navigate the complex and interlinked fields of artificial intelligence and robotics. Reflecting on how the US and South Korea can leverage their comparative advantages in AI applications, our distinguished speakers shared their perspectives on how both countries could enhance existing public and private partnerships to promote deeper collaboration in healthcare, robotics, and semiconductors. A notable takeaway from our first session was the increasingly frequent application of AI to discover new microchip technologies that can produce more advanced semiconductors. On the flip side, however, semiconductors support the AI revolution through their central role in driving computational power in algorithmic training. More detailed key findings from the first session are available through the link in the chat box below. For the second session, a U.S.-South Korea Technological Alliance and Semiconductors promises pressures and prospects. The panelists discuss the so-called CHIPS4 chips or FAB4 Alliance, a U.S.-led semiconductor partnership from pricing Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. They argued that the United States must articulate more concrete objectives from the proposed alliance. They also emphasized the importance of a mutually beneficial strategy for all four members, not an easy task given the interests of each member country to protect and champion their own semiconductor companies. The centrality of the Chinese semiconductor market for South Korea and Taiwan also makes full participation in the Fab Four Alliance difficult. Yet the recent global shortage of semiconductors underscores the urgency for resilient supply chains and broader cooperation, including between the United States and South Korea. Opportunities abound for the two countries to increase research and development, enhance the security and protection of intellectual property, and improve cross-country workforce development and skills transfer. More detailed key findings from our second session are now available as well through the link in the chat box below. And finally, today's virtual discussion, U.S.-South Korea cybersecurity cooperation in the era of 5G or 6G is the final part of our virtual series. Our distinguished panel will examine the opportunities and challenges of U.S. and South Korea's collaboration in cybersecurity amid the rapid deployment of 5G 
and the race to develop 6G networks. The US and South Korea recognize the importance of 5G and cybersecurity to maintain their respective economic and strategic edge in the information and communications technology field. As the first country to commercially launch 5G services in 2019, South Korea's Ministry of Science and ICT is developing a national cybersecurity strategy to support the ongoing rollout of 5G networks. South Korea is also a leader in 6G technologies. The U.S. has always considered cybersecurity a key component of its tech partnership with South Korea, given their shared risk of cyber attacks from state-sponsored cyber hackers. With growing concern over ransomware, the U.S. and South Korea could consider more engagement with cyber in cryptocurrency-related measures to combat cyber-enabled crime. For the third virtual session today of the Strengthening ROK Science and Tech Partnership on Critical Technologies, U.S.-South Korea cybersecurity cooperation in the 5G or 6G era, our esteemed speakers will discuss the, the very close relationship between 5G and its success for 6G and cybersecurity from the viewpoint of threat mitigation and cyber resilience. Today's presenter for our third session on U.S.-South Korea cybersecurity cooperation in the era of 5G or 6G are Dr. Lamy Kim, Assistant Professor at the U.S. Army War College and adjunct fellow at Pacific Forum. Dr. Su Jong Kim, Senior Research Fellow of the Institute for National Security Strategy, Strategy in South Korea. And Dr. John Park, Director of the Korea Project at the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. First, Dr. Lamy Kim is an Assistant Professor at the U.S. Army War College and an adjunct fellow at the Pacific Forum. Her research interests include the intersection between civil and military uses of nuclear energy, China's non-proliferation, nuclear export policy, and politics and security on the Korean Peninsula and in East Asia. Previously, Lamy served as a South Korean diplomat and a research fellow at Harvard's Belfer Center and Pacific Forum, Stimson Center, and Seoul National University Asia Center. She has taught at Harvard University and Boston College, and her works have been published in the Washington Quarterly, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, the Diplomat, PacNet, and Stimson Center, among others. Lamy holds a master's and a PhD degree in international affairs from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University and a master's degree in Middle Eastern Studies from Harvard University. Dr. Kim, you may proceed with your presentation. Well, thank you, Mari, for your kind introduction. And thank you to Pacific Forum um, to inviting, for inviting me today. I'm really delighted to be here today to talk about this very timely and important topic. I'll first br briefly introduce what 5G and 6G are, and then discuss some cybersecurity concerns that this new technologies raise and how, um, and how the U.S. is trying to address these concerns. And lastly, what, role that, uh, what roles that South Korea can play uh, in this endeavor. And before I begin, please note that I speak for myself, not for the U.S. Army or uh, the U.S. Department of Defense. Next slide, please. So just really briefly, um, first G, First generation powered the first mobile te telephone using analog radio signals, and 2G used digital signals and en enabled text messaging. 3G provided in in internet services and video calls, and 4G, which is significantly faster than 3G, enabled a great number of applications from Google Maps to Uber to Netflix. And you would agree that 4G has significantly changed the way we lived. And that the changes that the 5G will bring about will be even more groundbreaking. It's significantly faster with very low latency or delayed time and connects physical objects to networks, um, so-called internet of things, and they communicate with one another. So this technology enables uh, phys um, new civil civilian and military applications such as self-driving vehicles, smart cities, telemedicine, precision agricultural culture uh, systems, and autonomous weapons. Um, but but you might you, you might have been disappointed to the degree uh, to which that this technology has transformed transformed uh, the society so far. Uh, some say that with the um, the new technology, you know, it needs some time for new technology to mature, and uh, we might have to wait until the development of 6G in order to see really use the applications that 5G uh, promises. Um, 6G uh, is about 50 times faster than 5G with one tenth latency of 
5G. So basically no uh, latency. And 6G can provide internet services using satellites, low earth orbit satellites like Starlink, which allows the coverage to extend from two dimensions to three dimensions, enabling internet of everything, IOE, as opposed to internet of things which will enable holograms, autonomous flying vehicles, flying robots, and even the detection and tracking of hypersonic missiles. So given the importance of the mobile technology as the bedrock of the fourth industrial revolution and future warfighting capabilities, countries are in fierce competition in this area. Next slide, please. Uh, in the 5G equipment market, China is leading with Huawei accounting for about 30% of market share, followed by Ericsson, Nokia, Samsung, and ZTE, another Chinese company. Um, next slide, please. In terms of 5G deployment, South Korea is leading in terms of base station density, uh, like base station density per capita, basically, having deployed a um, base station per every about 320 people, but the, in terms of the sheer number of base stations, China is leading by far. And you can see here that the US is far behind and then the, the gap between China and the United States is widening because China's, China is aggressively adding its cell sites. Uh, for these reasons, uh, Graham Allison and Eric Smith assess that America is far behind China in almost every dimension of 5G. Um, I don't necessarily agree with this, you know, hundred percent, but we can get into this more a little bit later. Um, but what concerns me is that China is putting, investing a lot of money in in five G more than any other countries, and uh, because of its advances in the five G, China may have a competitive advantage in competitive edge in the uh, the six G race as well. Next slide, please. So why does this matter? Uh, China's dominance in the technologies matters greatly because uh, from national and international security and global uh, geopolitical perspectives. The most obvious and most direct security concerns that have been widely discussed is China's espionage and surveillance. Chinese manufacturers have built so-called backdoors to access sensitive data and network equipment. There are ample examples that could give you some if you want during the Q&A. Um, and you know, these companies, I mean, ZTE is a state-owned enterprise, but Huawei is a, a private company. However, um, these companies have very strong ties with Beijing. Beijing has funded, um, provided enormous amount of funding and, um, and also under uh, China's national intelligence law enacted in 2017, all Chinese citizens and organizations are required to serve um, uh, Beijing's agents and support China's intelligence activities. Cyber attacks are another worry, as Dr. Pryor mentioned during the opening, 5G is more vulnerable to cyber attacks than 3G and 4G, uh, simply because it, there are a lot of devices, users, and apps connected to the network, which uh, significantly broadens the attack surface. Um, and also the stakes are very high, Hackers may hack into self-driving cars to assassinate people, disrupt traffic light controlling systems, and even military command and control systems. And given these high stakes, countries like China could threaten network, net, network shutdowns in order to gain political objectives. And so far, China has not been really shy about weaponizing its economic cloud and other leverage for political purposes. And relying on China for digital infrastructure would give China a huge amount of leverage that it can exploit. Um, uh, next, next slide, please. So in order to, uh, the U.S. has made efforts to address the security concerns. Uh, the U.S. has limited the supply of microchips to China, um, and it has ordered the U.S. carriers to remove Chinese equipment from the networks and encouraged other countries to follow suit, which many countries in the world, especially in the West, have already implemented. Next, next slide, please. However, as you can see here, uh, a lot of countries, and especially developing countries in Southeast Asia, South America, and the Middle East, uh, they are either already using uh, or planning to use Chinese 5G equipment. 
And 5G equipment is limited in Africa, but these countries, countries in Africa are also likely to use Chinese equipment given their current use of Chinese 4G equipment and also China's growing influence in the region. Um, which is not hard to understand because 5G is very expensive um, and Huawei is offering its pretty solid technology at a fraction of the prices that other, other providers offer, which is possible thanks to Beijing's enormous amount of subsidies. Uh, we can talk more about you know, China's uh, other tactics that China is uh, using. Um, so next slide, please. So, so as such, it seems inefficient, insufficient for for Washington to simply try to persuade other countries not to use Chinese equipment. And so Washington is trying to uh, change the paradigm of 5G by pushing uh, for new technology, so-called uh, the open RAN technology, which creates a standardized and an open or interoperable interfaces between systems in the radio access network. What this means is that telecom companies will no longer need to buy one vendor's integrated uh, propriety system, but instead can purchase different hardware and co software components uh, separately. So uh, this technology uh, has the potential to decrease the influence of 5G equipment providers such as Huawei, although this technology is still in its infancy. Next slide, please. So I believe that South Korea has important roles to play in ensuring a secure and resilient utilization of 5G and 6G in the future, um, because especially, you know, the two countries, the United States and South Korea, uh, are ideal partners that compensate for each other's weaknesses. The U.S. has comparative advantage in microchip designs and operating systems, but doesn't build 5G equipment or manufacture microchips both of which South Korea does pretty well. And Samsung is one of the leaders in the open RAN technology, whereas Ericsson and Nokia are quite reluctant to pursue this technology. And Samsung's equipment seems more secure than Ericsson and Nokia because these European countries have a significant manufacturing operations in China, whereas China, Samsung um, manufactures their goods in South Korea and India. Um, and in, the, in addition, lastly, uh, South Korea and the United States should combine their forces to make advances in technology and innovation. Uh, the best way to counter China's dominance in the digital infrastructure is not to, uh, is, is to provide better technologies that are affordable prices. And so um, the two countries have enormous talent and they can, uh, the two leader leaderships have already agreed to cooperate in the development of 6G and open RAN te uh, technologies. And Samsung has already joined the so-called Next G Alliance, a group of companies in like-minded countries that collaborate for 6G innovation. It would be critically important for the United States, South Korea, and its partners to lead in this endeavor uh, because there will be huge first comer advantage in the uh, uh, 6G mm. race. Um, uh, just really last one, and uh, not only for economic uh, benefits, not only economic benefits, but also opportunities to set standards. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Lamy, for that very stellar overview of the development of 1G to 6G and what we can expect more in the years to come, and also really highlighting the pragmatic issues at hand, balancing the geopol geopolitical risks the Chinese um, Huawei and ZTE companies pose to um, cybersecurity in terms of their rapid development of, of 5G. And of course, uh, they're also on the race to develop 6G, but also really providing recommendations, practical recommendations and how the US and South Korea can maintain their competitive advantage. I do have some questions that I'd really like to reserve later on the Q&A regarding Open RAN and this issue of interoperability and really surprising that Samsung is playing a big role in this, um, the promotion of open, um, open RAN. And, and I'd re really like to um, have that discussion with you later in the Q&A. But for now, I'd like to yield the floor to Dr. Sun Jung Kim. Dr. Kim is a senior research fellow of the Institute for National Security Strategy in South Korea. Before joining INSS, she worked at the National Security Research Institute and led the cybersecurity policy team and provides recommendations on cybersecurity policy and regulatory issues. She was involved in drafting South Korea's national cybersecurity strategy published in April, 2019. She was also involved in the fourth and fifth 
UN group of governmental experts as an advisor and the Meridian process as an advisor and organizer. Her main research area is various policy issues regarding national cybersecurity policy, such as international norm setting processes, confidence building measures, CIIP, law and regulations, cybersecurity evaluation methodology development and comparison. And her recent paper actually is about the evaluation of cyber attack severity and proposing national response matrix. We do have a stellar panel for today. Dr. Kim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mark. And good morning and good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me here to talk about how ROK and USA can collaborate, especially in the 5G and 6G areas. I'm Sujan Kim, I'm of Institute for National Security Strategy in Seoul, and have been dealt with all the cyber policy issues for almost 20 years. And here I talk only with my personal capacity as a researcher. So let me begin cybersecurity cybersecurity collaborations with the communication technology assessment with several layers and angles. For this, I'll direct to touch upon several sub-issues. The first one is the communication network and infrastructure technological developments, what it means for us. And then secondly, I'll direct to a little bit talk about the standards and evaluations and security chain risk management things. And thirdly, we had to keep on our cybersecurity policy in domestic entity level. And also we have to deal with the cybersecurity issues in the context of international security issues. So first, um, after the 3G services deployment, as the Dr. Lamy Kim said before, it is not easy to feel the differences from the real user's point of view. Uh, we can see the differences 3G, 4G, 5G actually when we use the system itself. So we, in, we really enjoy that benefits, but we are not sure what can be the very specific difficulties or differences from here to there. So, so I feel it sometimes only has critical meanings for technical perspectives. For that, the 5G has hyper connections and low latencies as its main differences. So it is absolutely essential that many things are connected and react very immediately. So there is, of course, there is a lot of various security problems in communication services. So it should be prioritized to seek technical solutions. So however, uh, since the technological gap between the two countries and the strength and weakness of the two countries are so different, so much understanding must be proceeded in order to provide specific solutions for security enhancements. So the, the previous presenter, the Dr. Lamy Kim, maybe can give us more clear understanding of what can be the best way to collaborate each other with the strength and you know, weaknesses of both countries. So. And secondly, uh, the standards that have led this technological development have already been heavily subordinated to countries that we cannot trust. So this is not what happened yes yesterday or today. The fact that the standard has been preempted now proves that the other side has been preparing almost 10 years or long or over 20 years. So they are strategically interested in the way of thinking and dialogue presented by the West and including the United States. Because the standard platform itself was made by the, the, the Western countries and the, the China, the other countries, uh, they are exploiting that system and the, that platforms. So I, as they adjusted themselves, they expanded their influences. So it is now too late to point out that, that the technological superiority has been altered by the state. So we'll have to work hard on how to deal with this in the future. So in addition, uh, there are several acquisition regulations restricting the use of equipment, products, or services in accordance with these standards by domestic government agencies. So leading platform is common criteria but a new standard platform has been recently proposed for 5G network equipment. And they are usually got some support from Europe countries and those new criteria platform was um, supported by the Chinese government or Chinese companies. So 
It is a certain, if a certain country uses that for the purpose of avoiding network interdependencies, so it may be good options for them. So it is necessary to find a way to respect each country's autonomous choices, while at the same time, the secure credibility in the near future. The this issues naturally leads to supply chain risk management issues. When the concept of zero trust, a recent security trend, is extended to the national level rather than a single institution, the strengthening supply chain security becomes the first thing to do. Efforts to strengthen the current supply chain, not only for hardware, but also for the software are ongoing. And I know that the US government has already made quite a bit of progress. So in this field as well, cooperations between Korea and the United States will be able to do derived in detail. Especially we have US forces in our territory. The insecurity of communication through the sea cable network also have to enough uh, also have to have enough attention for the policymakers in both sides. And cybersecurity policies that are based on the general trust and considering the supply chain risk are being developed and implemented in a various way. So based on these efforts to be a secure, open and reliable cyberspace will evolve further. So there are many dialogue platforms that can establish norms and responsible state behaviors and actively pursue them. So it will be necessary to specify what topics and what specific topics will be discussed on what specific platforms. And lastly, the cooperation between the ROK and US in the cybersecurity field so far has been either very specific or practical or very abstract very high at the strategy level. So a framework that can act as an intermediary is needed. So it is a good example that the formation of a working group and a working level meeting between Korea and US are continuing to counter the theft of virtual assets such as cryptocurrencies from the North mm -hmm. Korea and the ransomware response initiatives in which more than 30 countries participated is actively moving. However, it is very surprising that there was no track to or 1.5 dialogues mm -hmm. to support these conversations between ROK and US. So currently, I'm working on to, uh, to making, uh, formating these efforts to having the uh, track to meeting bodies with the US side and mm -hmm. operated from next year. So it is hoped that the track to which has a policy mind, connect strategy and security practices, and connect the private sectors and the state will be operated normally from the next year and will make a great contributions in the future. So, for, and for now, I'll stop here and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Definitely great points about establishing a track to in 1.5 dialogue. And of course, um, we here at Pacific Forum are, have been quite um, active in this space, not only with South Korea, but also working with like-minded allies and partnerships to Singapore. And we would definitely be keen to involve. And we hope that this sort of conversation today with Dr. Lam Kim and also with Dr. Park and the rest of the Pacific Forum um, can definitely contribute to that discussion. Also, I think it's a great point that you raised about the insecurity of um, information communications technology uh, infrastructure that underpin um, the US and South Korea alliance, because these are definitely um, practical considerations for our defense and strategic partnerships. And also, the, of course, the much needed um, supply chain risk management, as you have um, intimated about hardware and software and also you've mentioned about this growing concern of ransomware and i think that's a perfect segue to our third speaker um who will definitely talk about more about north korea one of the cyber actors but also other um developments in that space um we have our final speaker for today dr john park he is the director of the korea project at the harvard kennedy school's Belfer center for science and international affairs his core research projects focus on deterrence economic statecraft, nuclear proliferation, Asian alliances, and North Korean cyber operations. At Harvard University, he is an associate, associated faculty member of the Korea Institute, faculty member of the Committee on Regional Studies East Asia, and a faculty affiliate with the Project on Managing the Atom. 
Earlier, Dr. Park worked at Goldman Sachs and the Boston Consulting Group. He also directed Northeast Asia Track 1.5 Dialogues at the U.S. Institute of Peace in Washington, D.C., and he advises Northeast Asia policy-focused officials in the U.S. government. He has testified in North Korea before the Senate Banking Committee, House Financial Services Committee, and House Foreign Affairs Committee. Dr. Park received his PhD from the University of Cambridge. Dr. Park, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And my thanks to the organizers, Pacific Forum, the ROK Consulate General of Honolulu and George Mason University, Korea. I'd like to start off by uh, just mentioning a uh, sad passing at the Belfer Center. Our director, Secretary Ash Carter, uh, suddenly passed away on Monday. And so in, in many respects, we're still trying to come to terms with that. It, it is very sudden and uh, such, such a sad event uh, in terms of uh, all the amazing work that Secretary Carter uh, continued to do at the Kennedy School. Uh, he was a pioneer in many areas. Uh, one that was near and dear to his heart was the intersection of national security and technology. And so uh, I feel very much uh, tonight as we all gather and with the phenomenal panel here, we uh, honor his legacy uh, by addressing some of these very, as he would say, the wicked problems related to uh, the cybersecurity space and some of the cyber threats there. When we look at the research that we've been doing at the CREA project, uh, the human factor are, are areas that I, I'd like to highlight uh, in my remarks, uh, building and using a, as a foundational piece, the excellent remarks from Professor Lamy Kim and Dr. Sojung Kim. Uh, the areas that I wanted to first start off with is the area of, of friction. So when we look at it from the perspective of the human factor here, uh, and before I go into some of the opportunities in US South Korea cyber security cooperation, wanted to look at it from this lens and some of our preliminary findings in our research here. In the private sector, the primary focus is really to remove friction, uh, to reduce it so that the user experience in a very competitive landscape becomes something that is a comparative advantage. And usually the different types of tech companies that win in this space are the ones who remove uh, the friction. So if you think of it from the analogy of the gaming sites, uh, some of the NFT service providers and product providers, the uh, virtual assets, all of them, despite the different types of services or products that they're engaged in, are focused in this optimization function of removing friction for the user. If we look at it from a, a very specific angle in terms of what's happening with North Korean cyber criminals, this has created uh, some phenomenal opportunities for them in terms of revenue generation. Their target of uh, crypto bridges, where you see uh, almost the seamless conversion of cryptocurrency into fiat, and fiat into cryptocurrency, a really important precursor for users to access the gaming sites, makes it a natural target for North Korean cyber criminals. And it seems that almost on a regular basis, we see the headlines. And as the, the most, I think, spectacular one in recent months, in March of 2022, North Korean cyber criminals stole approximately $620 million of cryptocurrency equivalents from the Ronin network, the crypto bridge that essentially facilitates access to the Axie Infinity gaming site. With this on the other side of the ledger, if this is the picture in the private sector, with respect to friction on the government sector side, clearly the government actors, and in the US, the primary actor is the Treasury Department. The focus is on increasing friction. And we see this with the recent designation of Tornado Cash and a precedent in a very important sense. And that Tornado Cash is not a physical company, doesn't have an address really isn't the focus of targeting or, or designating individuals, but really designating software. That, that's what drives Tornado Cash. And so with this, these type of mixers increasingly becoming the focus of uh, the Treasury Department before Blender IO, uh, we see here the dynamic play out, where if you zoom out, you essentially see on one side of the equation, North Korean cyber criminals going after the crypto bridges. And on the other side, actors like the Treasury Department targeting the mixers. And in this iterative game, this cat and mouse type of action, I think we get to see in the cyber domain, a type of dynamic related to the friction aspect that we are likely to see as the advancements as Dr. Kim has laid out, Professor Kim laid out uh, with the advancements with 5G and 6G, 
uh, why, while the technology certainly will be revolutionary in key instances, I think this human factor is an area that we have to keep in mind. The second piece under the heading of human uh, factor is the organizational cultural piece. If you look again under the private sector heading, what's being optimized here is the outcome, significantly more important than the process. Uh, this is very much driven in the uh, tech space, largely because of venture capital firms, very specific benchmarks and indicators and targets for revenue, where the outcome, profits, margins uh, at very specific intervals become uh, the focus of the model in this space of moving quickly and breaking things so they can learn and see how they can continually crank out these margins and these profits. On the other side of the ledger for the government sector side, there's an inversion. There's a greater focus on process over outcome. And with this, the scorecard is fundamentally different. My colleague at MIT, Dr. Jim Walsh, and I conducted a three-year study looking at how the North Korean regime, uh, the elements there, what we call North Korea Incorporated, accumulated learning and evading sanctions. And one of the things that we found with government entities applying sanctions on these targets, the indicator became more about the number, the quantity of programs, the quantity of sanctions applied on North Korea being the metric of quote unquote effectiveness. But when you look at it from this dynamic, the analogy that Dr. Walsh brings to the table is, it's almost like evaluating the effectiveness of a doctor, not based on his or her track record on patient outcomes, but the number of prescriptions they write or the number of surgeries they, they perform. And so this kind of dynamic, uh, I think uh, plays out a lot in terms of this human factor with relation to organizational culture. And as we see the opportunities unfold, as well as the challenges related to 5G and 6G, this is another aspect of human uh, factor to keep an eye on. Let me move to the final part uh, and focusing on some areas of cooperation opportunities between the United States and South Korea in the cybersecurity space. And, and as a previous speak, uh, speakers, speakers mentioned, uh, building on that, just really highlighting here the uh, tech supply chain coordination and opportunities there. This is something, as you see the movement towards 6G in particular, the necessity for these advanced microchips uh, and the growing competition between the United States and China from the US perspective, China being the pacing challenge and already uh, very dramatic moves and very important moves like the chips regulations coming through. Uh, we're already seeing something that is likely to increase in terms of scale and scope. And so something about the production here is going to be the further politicization, the geoeconomics, the geopolitics of it, with uh, tech supply chains becoming an important part of different groupings of countries. It's important to keep in mind that while from a policy perspective, tech supply chain, tech supply chain resilience, all of these things are targets in the private sector world, and certainly for consumers as well, there is an important uh, distinction in terms of trying to make advancements for policy goals and how it operates in the private sector and the consumer world. In that space, it's not a function of getting 99% right in terms of getting the different components in the tech supply chain. It's 100%. The smallest widget, the smallest component that either doesn't function properly or is missing in this tech supply chain uh, essentially means that the overall component, the overall equipment won't work. And the other thing to keep in mind and something that is a bottleneck, uh, essentially the number one, uh, as well as number two players in terms of the equipment, the semiconductor manufacturing equipment, reside in Japan and the Netherlands. And it's unlikely that we're gonna see a further expansion of capacity in that space anytime soon. And so this is where I think US-South Korea cooperation, and frankly, in stockpiling and thinking about strategic reserves of microchips is gonna be important in this period before things intensify. And then finally, I wanted to highlight the angle of law enforcement. Uh, my colleagues, Jason Bartlett, formerly of the Center for a New American Security, uh, Priscilla Marucci, who uh, has a background as a senior analyst at the National Security Agency, and Alex O'Neill, a researcher and co-lead of the North Korea Cyber Working Group at the Belfer Center, all focus on the importance of law enforcement angle and how law enforcement coordination with particularly allies like the United States and South Korea dynamic is crucial. One of the important distinctions and something that Dr. Kim highlighted as well, when you see the uh, types of rules and regulations and strategies coming online, in terms of the human factor here, on the US side, we see the Department of Justice and the FBI taking the lead. On the South Korean side, the National Intelligence Service, NIS, still owns the cybersecurity portfolio, if you will. 
as, as much as there is coordination and the idea of internal partnership with law enforcement in South Korea. But this is, I think, a priority in terms of expediting and making sure that the types of policies that have been quite groundbreaking and revolutionary on the U.S. side, there's like a docking mechanism with allies, in particular, in this instance, South Korea. And with this, I think there's an important necessity that this type of law enforcement coordination at a granular level in an operational sense is uh, very much a necessary condition, but that in and of itself is not sufficient. What I mean by that is a crucial role of partnership interaction with the private sector. For the very point that I mentioned earlier about the dynamics related to friction, private sector will always be optimizing the reduction of friction, cognizant that there's a trade-off in terms of vulnerabilities but that's something that private sector is unlikely to change anytime soon, all the more meriting this type of coordination with law enforcement to better anticipate how some of these trends will play out. So with that, I'll turn that back to you. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Park. Indeed, a lot of um, great insights to pick on there. Um, as you uh, mentioned about the importance of how policy really drills down to the perspective of implementing it from the viewpoint of the private sector and also with the consumer, as well as this need to reframe. I think this builds on what um, Dr. John Kim also discussed about um, bridging what the US and South Korea can do in terms of um, increasing cooperation in cybersecurity on how, for instance, law enforcement are still being handled by different agencies and how both countries can find ways to lubricate uh, such types of cooperation. And I would note that um, a lot of um, in cybercrime, at least, and you know, in the region, I think U.S. companies such as Meta um, plays a, a leading role in providing evidence that are being used to persecute, you know, cyber criminals, which are may or may not be directly related to North Korea. You also mentioned about the human factor, which oftentimes has always been, uh, you know, um, left uh, in the conversation because we're very focused on the technical aspects of, of tech, tech policy or whenever we talk about cybersecurity in 5G and 6G. So I leave it there. Um, I know we have so many, uh, we have participants um, online that are also very keen to um, participate. Um, uh, I'd like to thank uh, all our uh, participants and also our panelists for sharing your thoughts on cybersecurity cooperation in the 5G and 6G era, I'm sure. Um, some of our audience have their own questions and comments to make, have about 30 minutes left um, for questions and discussions. But if any of the um, speakers would like to react or raise a point based on the other um, insights or perspectives that were shared by other speakers, you may also do so while we wait for questions um, to trickle in. I think I'll start first with, with um, Dr. Lam Mikim. You've mentioned that Samsung has, has been moving its supply chain um, in India and the other territory. Is it Southeast Asia or? Oh, no, no, it's just um, South Korea and India. South Korea and India. So mm -hmm. my, que my question is, given the opportunity that um, Huawei has definitely seized the commanding heights of 5G, as also Dr. Su Jung Kim has discussed in terms of not only the production aspect, but also in standard setting that they've been having this long-term view over a decade ago. How do you think Samsung could, could potentially be um, also get a greater sum of the pie, particularly in, you know, in, in other developing economies such as South, uh, Southeast Asia or Latin America mm. or even you know, Africa? Yeah, sure. I mean, as you, as you could see in the chart that I showed you earlier, Samsung's share in the 5G equipment market is not that big, uh, but it is growing because especially it is uh, sort of filling the gaps left by Huawei's equipment. For example, in the UK, uh, Huawei's equipment has to be removed by 2020. And recently, South Korea got a deal uh, from Vodafone in the UK to fill the gap and actually to provide the um, open RAN technology. And it has received a lot of orders from companies in Canada, the United States, basically the Western countries, sort of the US and South Korea's uh, partners and, and friends. Um, but I think that in developing countries, as you mentioned, um, I think it will be difficult to, to counter China's influence because China um, offers very attractive prices. And also what Huawei is doing is quite smart. Uh, Huawei says, 
if you buy our equipment, then we will also give you surveillance technology, cloud systems, and other other systems at very low prices. And uh, that's very attractive for for developing countries, low income countries, especially for authoritarian regimes that are, you know, not too, um, you know, careful about protecting data and also are probably interested in using surveillance technology that China provides. And so, uh, and then in the meantime, China can also, by providing the services, China can also collect data from, from these countries. Um, so that's why I think that's where open RAN technology comes in. I think that that is a very promising technology, although one caveat is that it's still early uh, uh, in, in the development. And so we, we don't really know how successful this technology mm -hmm. will be. But the reason why this, this technology is promising and then the US Congress and the White House are pushing for it is because um, it could lower the prices, you know, so Samsung can also and other, other um, open RAN technology providers can offer good prices because uh, Huawei, you know, Huawei provides this whole package sort of black box type of equipment where um, all software and hardware components have to be provided by Huawei. But if you open these interfaces, then you can pick and choose, you know, different services, different softwares. And so, and there will be um, competition that, that will drive down the prices and there will be innovation. And so this is a one way to go. And then also, um, in American software companies, the U.S. is comparative advantage of software, right? And then the U.S. companies can can come in. And so I, I think that this is an area where the two countries collab can collaborate and then provide better services, better technologies and be um, um, counter China. Yeah, thank you so much, Lamy, for that um, elaboration. I'd like to turn to you, Dr. Park. Um, if you could also share with us, or have you had heard knowledge about the International Counter Ransomware Initiative? Um, the Biden administration has launched this um, recently in 2021 that sort of equating ransomware now into some sort of act of terrorism. And in, in your research, um, looking into North Korea's cyber operations, do you think that elevating ransomware as a national security concern can have can impact at least you know or mitigate the risk of of cyber crime um, posed by a ransomware specifically posed by um, North Korean um, sponsored or related um, cyber groups. Thank you for that. Uh, I think one of the major points that comes up in uh, doing the research, interacting uh, with those who are close to the victims. I had a chance to uh, testify uh, before the House uh, recently looking at the House uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, looking at North Korean cyber criminal activities as one subset of it and interacting with uh, some of the staffers afterward. It, it was interesting. My, I, my curiosity was, you know, for your members, what what uh, North Korean cyber criminal activity uh, comes up in, in terms of uh, constituents reaching out uh, to members? A lot of small businesses in the United States, in states that really don't have this direct you know, foreign policy or national security angle to Asia, you have a lot of these uh, small businesses reaching out to their members asking for help because they have been the victims of ransomware. So one of the major points that comes out of that is on a fairly wide basis, we have the violation of U.S. national economic security. And so I think this equation of trying to figure out ways to elevate uh, and bring to bear other policy tools in addressing it is a step in the right direction. The challenge here though, is that when you trace back and when some of the very technically focused forensic investigation type of firms look at some of these instances uh, with fairly high degree of confidence, they trace it back to IP addresses in Southeast Asia to different parts of China. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to quote unquote retaliating or responding, you essentially get into challenges in terms of sovereignty of these countries. And so I think, uh, again, this is a step in the right direction with measures like this, but uh, one urgent necessity, I think, is just mapping out more the marketplace of how mm -hmm. ransomware is taking out and the evolutions there and having that kind of diagnosis of how the different actors are interacting and what the evolutions and trends are. And frankly, this is for a business type of mentality from the perspective of the cyber criminals, I think that will yield more insights in terms of how we can better address this. Right. 
And I think um, that's a perfect segue to my question to Dr. Su Jung Kim, and you mentioned Dr. Park about sovereignty. Has there been any of these developments, um, Dr. Su Jung Kim, been discussed at least at the UN GGE or at the UN OEWG, given the increasing threats of um, ransomware um, and also the increasing challenges of actually um, persecuting or law enforcement because most of these groups are based um, in countries that could you know have difficulty uh, implementing rules or have any shared sort of um, obligation in terms of law enforcement and obtaining electronic evidence at least at the UNGGE or at the U UNOEWG. Okay, thank you. Uh, regarding the UN discussions, you know, there's a several platforms that to deal with the cybersecurity. So the GGE and OEWG is more focused on the international security by the state. So regarding the cyber criminal activities, there's another platform to deal with that one, especially with the cybersecurity law enforcement uh, uh, cooperations among member countries. And also there's another platform for the talking about the cyber uh, terror, terrorism kind of. So the GGE and OEWG is not the place, the fit places to talk about, but they are really concerned about the, the reality and then the, their bad activity is uh, getting gro growing. So they are well aware of that, but the place is not the one that. Thank you very much for that. And I think just to round up all these um, first round of questions, You've mentioned Dr. Su Jong Kim about establishing a track 1.5 or track 2 dialogue for US South Korea. And I've mentioned this could be our conversation today could potentially lay the groundwork for that. Uh, what what you have what do you what sort of concrete ideas um, would you want to see in a US South Korea track 1.5 and or track two dialogue? And I see Dr. Su Yong Kwan nodding her head um, very, very eagerly over there. Um, we can start with you, Dr. Su Jung Kim, and then we could go to um, Dr. John Park. And also, lastly, we go to Lamy before we field the questions from our audience. Uh, yes, uh, regarding the track two, uh, actually, um, you know, you, everybody understands that we had the uh, summit in May, the US and Korea, right? And right after that, uh, the, in, especially the cybersecurity, uh, specialists and the government officials wanted to have somewhere, some places to talk more frankly and to understand each other better, not just the government and official way, but but more frank way. So right after that, um, there's some um, asks that having the the tractor platforms. So I've contacted several uh, think tank before, and I'm now under processing to formating that one but very frankly it, it is it will be very open for all the the cybersecurity experts in in us side and korean side but we definitely we are trying to talk about the, this all these issues the the supply chain things and ransomware things and then information the cooperation between the law enforcement agencies and the governances everything will be included so i'm very happy to you know be open about that one but definitely that the platform itself will have a great role to intermediating to countries dr park any thoughts I think what uh, Dr. Kim mentioned there are important uh, initiatives there, and certainly things that uh, are very welcome. And as she mentioned, some of these initiatives are underway uh, and great opportunities uh, to add to it. I, I would just look at it also from an additional point in terms of talent, and so new talent in particular. So all of the players and actors that Dr. Kim mentioned are, I think, critical. And in terms of uh, another perspective, bringing into these types of discussions, I think it's a private sector one. From the uh, angle of uh, portfolio of identities, if you will, uh, we've been very fortunate in working with more joint degree students. These are students who are doing two master's degrees, one at the Harvard Kennedy School, looking at public policy, many of them coming from a foreign policy background, and also uh, at business schools. And there's a consortium, not only Harvard Business School, but Stanford Business School and Wharton. 
Uh, and likewise, we have individuals coming in from the private sector who are interested in applying their private sector experience to public policy issues. The main thing that comes out of working with these type of individuals is that they can see how the dots are connected. And if you imagine an exchange rate, they are able to calculate in their own way uh, with uh, a, a certain level of nuance that I think is uh, pretty important, uh, how these would translate out. So how policy would play out in the private sector and also how some of the private sector adjustments to policy could also unintentionally negatively affect some of the policies. So I think engaging some of these type of actors in these dialogues uh, will be another important element as these type of initiatives grow. Thank you very much, Dr. Park. Um, Lamy? Yeah, a lot of great uh, in insights and points, but I'd like to add one sort of agenda, one issue that the two countries will have to, to discuss, uh, which is, you know, um, South Korea is now one of those countries that removed all Chinese equipment uh, budget equipment uh, built in South Korea. So, I mean, built in the, their countries. So LG uh, uses Huawei's equipment for about 30% of its 5G uh, equipment. And um, I mean, you know, uh, in a way it is understandable. I understand where, why LG made the decision and why it is so in, uh, difficult to remove the equipment built by Huawei uh, because uh, LG used Huawei's equipment for its 4G. Uh, network and so it was uh, it would have been too much too expensive to build 5g standalone network equipment uh, so i understand that however um from security perspectives i mean these we are talking about two very close al al allies that share very sensitive military um, intelligence. And then we have to address this issue of potential security and intelligence um, uh, vulnerability um, uh, at a certain point. I, but but I understand that South Korea is in a very tricky position. Of course, uh, China is a very important economic partner and also a very important actor in addressing North Korea related issues from nuclear weapons and reunification. Uh, I understand South Korea is in a difficult position. However, this is a very important issue, I think, going forward. Thank you so much, Lamy. Yes, Dr. Kim, would you like to... Yes, of course, the 5G and the, the LG Plus and Huawei things is a very difficult to solve. But, and, but you have to understand that the, first of all, the, the, the connectivity of the technological perspective is not that very simple. That's why the EU countries and UK also uh, cannot do something in a very quick way. They had to take like three or five or 10 years to make it over and take the next step. So maybe for Korea, we also need some more time to prepare that one. That's why I mentioned about this standardizations and evaluations of the software things at the same time. So if we pre prepare it within, with like a five or a 10 year long perspective speech and then, then we can have something common to to have and also uh, it will gonna very um, deal, um, connect with the real people with the private sectors. So you know those track to not only from only government perspectives, but also we are trying to reflect our private sector positions on that one. So it can be a track to and and sometimes it can be a 1.5 but the whole opinions from every sector is we're gonna deal with very openly but in korean cases a little bit different from the u.s cases that the major big companies and tech companies is not that like in the u.s cases in korea and also the critical infrastructure critical information infrastructures the owners and the operators not just by the private sectors but they have very strong relationship with the government officials so we have to also very cautious about that their status so that's my two quick comments on that Thank you so much, Dr. Kim, Lamy, and, and Dr. Park. We have so many questions. I think just to break the monotony of, of me speaking, um, asking questions, I'd like to call on one of our participants, um, Jenny. Uh, would you like to ask your question to our um, stellar panelists? Jenny, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. 
Great, thanks for having me and, and thank you so much for your remarks. Um, my question, um, I mean, Sojong started to get into this already a little bit. Um, in the future, sort of what do you think will be sort of a main roadblock uh, that may hinder more closer and sustained cooperation between US and South Korea on a particular cybersecurity issue? And, and please feel free to sort of hone in on a, on a particular aspect. I am asking this question because I mean, all three speakers touched on uh, different areas where we need more cooperation between uh, the USROK. So I just want to kind of challenge the, the panel and to think about what would be sort of the main roadblock or challenge to achieving that. Thanks. So can I go first? We okay, we love a volunteer. Go ahead, Dr. Kim. <laughs> yes, good to hear it, Jenny. And um, thanks for question. And the very simple answer is the the first one is um, um, English, and the second one is the translation among the people and among the sectors. So the English one, you know, uh, there's very little um, researchers. There's a lot of good professional researchers in Korea, but they have um, with the field experience and then uh, social science, but there's uh, some difficulties to make it their statement understanding in English. So it is very hard for me to find a very good person to speak in English is what they have in their mind. So that was the number one thing. And then second one is that still the translations and you know, still in the strategy level and policy making level and then the field level, they don't talk each other, but it, sometimes they talk, but they, uh, talk differently. So still we need that one in domestically and with the U.S. together. Thank you. Dr. Park, please. I, I would uh, just add uh, one of the big obstacles, uh, not only now, uh, but certainly going in the uh, future is what, what I call Chinese economic disciplining. And that's using uh, economic statecraft to essentially through dialing up and dialing down restrictions to market access uh, to try to moderate the behavior of other countries. We saw that uh, with a number of countries, uh, Australia most recently, and so on, on this sustained cooperation between the United States and South Korea on cybersecurity issues. Uh, as we go down this path where the US and China, and particularly with the CHEP uh, regs, uh, it's clearly pitting countries uh, in terms of choosing sides. And if that is going to be the trend that we are going to see uh, deepening, then I think it increases the likelihood that we will see a recurrence of China's application of economic uh, disciplining. I, I would just quickly add that China applies economic disciplining not as a version of sanctions as we know it, because in the U.S. approach, it's rooted in rule of law, coordinating with other countries to essentially modify their laws so that uh, it makes the implementation of these type of sanctions uh, seamless and, and highly effective. In the Chinese case, uh, you're, you're looking at it not from changing any laws or requiring any countries to do any other type of those uh, policy-oriented changes. Uh, it's behavior-related and, again, to market access. Uh, and so these are areas that I, I do think that countries are highly vulnerable to, particularly U.S. allies. And one of the key takeaways even from countries like Australia with such a close security alliance relationship with the United States, there was really nothing that the United States and other countries could do. And it was essentially waiting it out, uh, hoping for an improvement of the situation. Uh, and so I do think we, we need to focus more on how we can address the greater uh, recurrence of uh, economic discipline by China. Lemmy? Yeah, uh, well, so, well, some people, some experts, have um, um, raised concerns about South Korea's informational security. I mean, I don't really know too much about it, but uh, uh, when it comes to, for example, the issue of including South Korea in five eyes, for example, uh, some say that, of course, South Korea is not really keen on joining in either, but uh, other members will be a little bit nervous to have South Korea because of relatively uh, lax informational um, or, uh, security. Um, so, so one example is that there was a uh, hacking incident uh, by North Korea uh, into a military computer uh, where they uh, they stole some operational plans of very sensitive military operation, uh, decapitation operation, and also there was a soldier, a major, I 
something or um, anyway, the military personnel who was um, get paid uh, not that much amount of money, but anyways, paid like above 40,000 or something dollars in Bitcoin and then transferred um, this decapitation operational uh, strategy, a plan. And so I, I, uh, I was pretty um, uh, puzzled by how this pretty low ranking military personnel could access uh, this very sensitive information and then and that sort of stuff. So, uh, of course, I don't really know too much about South Korea's, um, uh, um, how South Korea is doing, but I've been hearing some concerns that, that could serve as an obstacle to uh, the cooperation between the two countries. All right, thank you so much for those great um, responses. I think let's move on because um, we only have like 15 minutes left and we have questions um, in the chat box or in our Q&A. I think the next question um, would be from uh, Jessica Taylor. She asks, what is the status of the export control restrictions of semiconductor key chemicals that Japan imposed in South Korea a few years ago? I think this builds on our the discussion um, about the semiconductor equipment. And also I think a major sort of point across all three speakers today is the importance of semiconductors moving forward. And even Dr. Park has mentioned stockpiling. So I think this speaks more about the export control um, that was that has happened with Japan and South Korea. And I think against the backdrop of shortage of um, chips, the, how has that relationship progressed or uh, improved uh, as far as um, the current um, geopolitical or geostrategic environment? Would any of the speakers would like to respond? Well, I'll just take a step at the first question about the Japan issue, Japan Korea issue. I, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but I have been asking uh, people about that. And I don't, both Koreans and uh, some American experts uh, recently said that there has not been that much of an impact uh, on South Korea's uh, supply chain. Uh, in the beginning, there were some issues, but there were uh, private companies, Japanese companies, and you know, the private sector has uh, found a way to get around those sanctions and sort of controls. And so I, I may be wrong. Maybe uh, Dr. Kim has more, um, uh, more accurate information, but that's what I've been hearing. Actually, I, I, I was not that uh, well aware of the, the, the semiconductor and Japanese issues yet, but definitely right after that, you know, they tried it to really, really uh, make very big impact to the Korean side, of it, but actually it turns out not that big uh, influences impact us from this, those actions. At, in, in the other hand, I mean, uh, the other ICT ministry of Korean side wanted it to have more fostering the, the fundamental R&D and some other, other government supporting for that kind of gap. So it was turned out, I mean, positive way, not that bad, bad way, but not that clear about the one. The exact numbers were some other factor areas. It was not very clear, but definitely for the other R&D part, they got a lot of support from the government side to, to get over the, the impact. All right, um, moving forward with other questions. Uh, we have Fred Plan who also asked, what are some ways we can discuss and begin to address North Korea cyber operations without letting the discussion get distracted or overshadowed by other security issues, such as nuclear issues or human rights. I think it's about, you know, having a laser focus on um, the issue of North Korea cyber operations. And I think everybody um, in the panel is free to respond, but I'd like to start with Dr. Park uh, on this question. I do believe there there's an important angle to this actually, and it's not a function of, you know, moving and focusing on the one particular issue, I, I do believe they're interconnected in, in an important in an important manner. Uh, anecdotally, if you hear about the experience and the conditions under which North Korean cyber operators uh, live, you know, these, these in terms of their documentation as they present themselves in uh, Southeast Asian countries and so forth, they're IT workers. But the conditions under which they live uh, truly is, is appalling. And so I think from that angle, uh, further investigating how 
uh, they're going about their uh, different types of operations, the conditions under which they live. Uh, I, I do think there's some important elements to try to uh, create some incentives uh, for potentially either defections or other something along those lines. Uh, but this is a vulnerability and uh, something that uh, there could be, again, interesting opportunities there. But under that heading of an exploited condition, uh, I do think that, that that's something we have to pay more attention to as well. Any thoughts, uh, Dr. Kim and Lamy on that? Oh, go ahead, please. Yeah, so when, whenever we uh, talk about the North Korean cyber operations and the other way of doing, uh, it is very difficult for us to not relating those uh, parts at the same time. So my recent work was about the cybersecurity, uh, cyber attack severity methodology to evaluate the, how seriously we got impacted from a certain cyber attack and then how we can react with that. So we so proposed the national red, uh, response metrics. So in that, we trying to understand what can be the effective measures to respond to the bad, bad behavior from North Koreans and not only whenever we talk, think about that one, the impact cannot be very effective for the in for the North Korea if we only deal with the cybersecurity way because the users and the 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 expansions in IT infrastructures in North Korea is totally different from South Korea and the U.S. or the other advanced countries. So. We cannot only deal with the IT perspectives. That's why maybe we also we sometimes have to think about the other way of doing the, the countermeasuring that one. But whenever the one the other reason when we talk about the North Korea, uh, we always put the the other political things and the human rights things is that there is a very little um very little understanding what's going on in cybersecurity area or cyber area in North Korea and Korea and US way. So the, the major uh, lots of social science are very well aware of what's going on in nuclear things and the, the other policy things and human rights things, but they are not fully aware of the, there's very little people to understand what's going on in the cybersecurity or cyber field. So maybe um, that's why the, the answers from them can easily be linked to the nuclear or the traditional, the answers. But if there's more people are interested in this field, then you know we were gonna have more cre creative way to countermeasure of that one. All right. So I think moving on to another question with regards to uh, with regard to DPRK cybercrime, some people view that even with strengthening of law enforcement between the US and South Korea and other related or partner countries, there still is still a loophole and that is China particularly given the nature of cybercrime based on anonymity and guerrilla style operation. These people view that it is mission impossible to tackle DPRK cybercrime. So any, what's your perspective on that? Um, Dr. Park, um, Lamy, or Dr. Kim as well, please. Well, in general, it is really difficult to tackle cyber crimes. And when it comes to North Korea, North Korea has the capacity, pretty sophisticated cyber cap capabilities, and has very strong motives, especially because it is under huge, uh, severe sanctions and it's in dire need of uh, hard currency. And so I am very skeptical that we can actually really address this, this concern. Dr. Park? Mm -hmm. Uh, if if, uh, if uh, Dr. Kim would like to answer first, uh, that'd be great. I feel like this is right up her alley. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, uh, last, uh, last month, I had the international conferences on the cybersecurity things in Korea, and we invited very great uh, experts from all the world. And, and uh, one of the issue was the about the cryptocurrency things. So technically, they were one hundred percent sure that they can um, follow the main the the 
uh, the what the, the fiat to the cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency to fiat. They can do, they can follow the whole the uh, processes, and they can identify who the which asset or which this asset can be used or not. But the uh, the one thing we are not sure about the the political part of the attributions identification. So it is. Uh, I I don't think it is. Uh, mission impossible but it is very hard one so if we have more uh, calculated or evidence-based uh, point of view to identify and attribute the attackers in with the collaborated way then you know we can have the answers finally yeah uh, dr parker if you have any um additional input to that please uh, I, I would just say, uh, you know, we've been following uh, the the work of uh, Professor Kim and, and uh, Dr. Sojong Kim on on uh, the areas related to uh, North Korean cyber criminals, and uh, you know, one of the things that uh, really comes up is an opportunity as we view it from the community and the marketplace of cyber criminals. Uh, there there are increasing partnerships. Uh, Alex O'Neill, my colleague. Uh, wrote a piece looking at cyber criminal statecraft, as he calls it. So these are cyber criminals who are linked to uh, state actors, nation state actors. And one of the angles that he uh, focused uh, a lot on was North Korean cyber criminals and Russian speaking criminal groups. Uh, and I think when we view it from the marketplace, what motivates them anecdotally, what type of exploits, what type of you know cyber heists they pulled off, uh, if we can build up those case studies, I do think what uh, we can start piecing together uh, through qualitative research are the uh, practices, the partners, and the pathways of these different types of cyber criminal actors. Uh, this is on the rise. This is something that on a number of uh, indices, I think the uptick is attributed to something that wasn't planned. This wasn't orchestrated by uh, cyber criminals and specifically North Korean cyber criminals. But during the pandemic, you had such a migration in a short period of time, people doing e-commerce and doing uh, different types of transactions on the internet, that it just made it a rich, you know, target-rich environment. Uh, and so the two features that come out, one is that increasing targeting of small and medium businesses, not the big brand names that we hear about in terms of the headlines in the newspapers. Uh, so while the quantity uh, of uh, you know, whatever was stolen was small, if you look at the number of victims, it is something that turns out to be quite lucrative. And the second feature, these victims don't report in terms of a large number of these either uh, heists or uh, ransomware exploits. And that's because they don't want the information out there that they've been hacked. That would be the end of a small business uh, that you know individuals are running. So these are, these are areas where I do think we can, through these type of case studies, uh, again, assemble more in terms of just deepening our knowledge, as Dr. Kim mentioned as well. Uh, but the pieces are, are certainly out there and we can uh, increasingly connect the dots. That's right. And I think just to add on the issue of China being the loophole, um, I think a lot of Southeast Asian countries are also safe havens for North Korean cyber criminals and also some countries in Africa. So it's definitely, uh, we're all in this together. Um, we sink, we sink or we, you know, we sink or we rise uh, on this issue of cyber crime and cyber enabled threats. And on that, I think I'll, I'll give the speakers any final thoughts, um, any final words um, before we wrap up the session. Um, uh, we can start with Dr. Um, Lam Kim and then Sujong Kim, and then finally with Dr. Park. Well, uh, it's been a very interesting uh, uh, discussion. Thank you for uh, the panelists and the questions. Um, uh, well, I think this is an ongoing issue. The technologies are developing day by day, but I'm very concerned that the U.S. is really behind. I'm not just talking about the rollout and the equipment and stuff like that, the repercussions of being behind uh, de developing and rolling out these technologies is that, you know, uh, China is already developing the sophisticated, sophisticated applications using this um, uh, 5G network uh, services and also uh, through those services and applications that is already collecting a lot of data, not only within China, but also from other countries. And so that will uh, further contribute to China's development of in an artificial 
intelligence, which can, uh, which will have a lot of implications. Um, and so I think that this is in the area where uh, the two countries can really collaborate and then um, um, do better. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Actually, I really enjoyed to this question and answers and your um, perspective of how we can solve the problem in in the future. So that was a great opportunity for me and for, for myself. I'm very interested in how we can solve this problem with our uh, dialogue and also at the same time, how we can um, convince our, our, uh, ourselves to, to do something together in a, in a um, collaborated way because the I, I felt a little um, differences is the how e, the the collaboration can work in the future so maybe uh, they can give a, a lot of uh, things to work in the future so hopefully uh, talk to you later too thank you Uh, it, it's uh, it was a privilege to be on the panel with uh, Professor Kim and, and Dr. Kim. The the one uh, point that that I like to conclude with is that this is a marketplace phenomenon. Uh, North Korean cyber criminals are up using their capabilities and their tools to steal money and money equivalents uh, in a dominant sense. Certainly, they're using those capabilities el elsewhere as well. And so, uh, the the one big point for me is that. When we look at it from that perspective of what Dr. Walsh and I call North Korean Incorporated, these elite entities of the North Korean state trading company structures and whatnot, what they've done in the past, North Korea Incorporated has gone virtual. And with this, uh, they operate like a business because they are focused on making money. And so I, I think there will be more and more insights as we look at the marketplace of uh, how these cyber criminal activities are playing out. Uh, and I think dialogues and the research here are critically important. So look look forward to future co uh, collaborations on that front. Thank you again to the organizers. Thank you very much, Dr. Park, uh, Dr. Lamy Kim, and Dr. Sujong Kim for your great insights into all our audience and participants who you know co ask questions. And we apologize for those who weren't able to address um, because of lack of time. And so I will now hand it back over to Crystal for the closing remarks. Thanks, Mark, and thank you to our speakers and participants for joining us today. We'd also like to express our appreciation to the Consulate General of the Republic of Korea in Honolulu and George Mason Korea's Center for Security Policy Studies for making this event possible. <clears throat> I'd also like to remind you of the post-event survey available on our event page, which we'll share again in the chat box now. We really would appreciate it if you take just a few minutes to complete it and share your feedback as we want to make um, all of the webinars that we run as engaging and productive as possible. We hope you'll continue staying engaged with Pacific Forum programming, which you can find out about more on our website, www.pacforum.org. And please stay tuned for more details by subscribing to Pacific Forum or by following us on social media. Thank you again, and we hope you have a great uh, rest of your day or afternoon or evening, wherever you're located. Thank you and goodbye.